Welcome to episode 94 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us. Listener, you've made the right choice. This is an award-winning podcast, uh, voted best winter sports podcast in the uh, Sports Podcast Awards. Today, we're going to be finding out about Svalbard and Narvik in uh, Norway. Uh, We're going to be talking to uh, Jasmine Taylor, Telemark World Cup skier, and we're going to be finding out what new lifts have been planned for ladies out over the next uh, few years. Uh, Firstly, I'd like to thank Switzerland Tourism for their support. Uh, you may not know this, but the uh, Plan Mort sector in Coral Montana is open to uh, skiers. Uh, they have a snow park up there that's open until the uh, 5th of June. So uh, if you're really keen to uh, get in some kickers and half pipes, that's a place to go. Uh, but my name is Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today. Firstly, I'm delighted to welcome back to the show uh, Jasmine Taylor, uh, Team GB Telemarker. Hi, Jasmine. How are you? Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. I know sometimes you're based in in uh, Les Ouches, uh, in Chamonix. Whereabouts are you today? Uh, I'm currently at home in Ipswich. And I, I say I'm very well. You can probably hear a bit in my voice. I've not actually been very well. Um, so it's always nicer to be at home when you've not been feeling 100%. Okay. Well, I can relate to uh, that. I'm trying to get rid of a cough myself. Hopefully, listener, you won't hear it because I'll edit all those bits out. Uh, we're also joined today by uh, Rob Rees, freelance journalist. Hi, Rob. How are you and where are you? I'm very well. Nice to see you again, Ian. I'm in Oxford um, and I'm just back from my last ski trip of the season, which was to northern Norway. And I'm still falling over my ski bags and dirty clothes here. Right, well we're going to be talking about that later, now you won't be able to see this, we're on video at the moment, but Rob is sporting uh, a great Norwegian jumper uh, for our benefit. And we're also joined today by uh, Al Morgan from Ski Kit Info. Hi Al, you all right? I'm good, thank you Ian, how are you doing? Yeah, good, you look like you're in a different room from normal for a recording. Yeah, yeah, slightly change of uh, location just in my house today, that's all. Right. Okay. No skis behind you. I normally like no, that. Not, yeah, expecting. not not today. It's nice and sunny here today. So but you've still got your ski kit info, uh, hoodie and uh, hat on. So that's yeah, really still working. Now I know Al when you last went out to the Alps, but uh, and Rob probably has given us a clue now. But let's start by asking my guests when they last skied or snowboarded. What about you, Jazz? When were you last on snow? Last Friday. Oh, not bad. <laughs> Where was that? Hint tucks. Is that? end of season training or was that uh you know ledger skiing do you ever get that yeah it, it, it was uh, a basic course actually how did that go it went very well yeah it went very well i i passed so that's good but it was a telemark course so i, sh- I should have been very <laughs> very upset if i had <laughs> not passed what level basic was that that was level three telemark um and i recently I say completed. I still have one thing left to do. But aside from this one last exam, I've sort of ticked off the Alpine level four as well. So I'm quite I'm quite happy. Great. And what, what was the snow like at uh, Hintertooks? Um, variable. Yeah, some days it was really good. Some days not so good, a bit sticky. But um, on the whole, pretty good, really. When you're out on uh, for a course like that, are you out on the slopes all day or do you stop skiing kind of towards lunchtime because it gets a bit wet in the afternoon? No, in Hintertux, it doesn't actually. It stays, okay. it stays cold all day. So we really are on the hill six hours. Right. Okay. Good work. And Rob, what about you? When were you last uh, on snow? I think you gave us a hint just then. I think it was about 12 days ago. I was up in uh, Narvik um, inside the Arctic Circle. So that was quite something else. Excellent. Well, we're going to be talking about that in more detail. So we'll come on to that uh, in due course. I can actually reveal that I was skiing more recently than any of you, I think, because I went skiing on uh, Wednesday. I was up at the uh, snow center in Helmer Hempstead uh, for Listex. So let's hear what I thought of the slope itself. Hi, it's Ian here, and I'm skiing at the snow centre in Hemel Hempstead. And the first thing I really want to impress is that you forget, you think, oh, we're in the UK, it's just indoors. It is bloody cold in here. I don't know what the temperature is, but I've got gloves on, and my hands are starting to get very cold. And it makes sense, otherwise, how could you have loads of snow? I mean, there's no melt, there's no thaw today. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's, um, it's hard packed. It's uh, you know, there's a good snow covering. It's uh, it's quite even, and you know, any day on the snow is better than no day. So this is uh, I'm counting this towards my ski days for this season. 
Now, very much at the last minute, Mike Richards is out in Japan at the moment and he sent us in this snow report, so I thought I'd squeeze it in. Good morning, Ian, or as they say in these parts, Ohio gozaimasu. After 26 months away, I managed to get back to Hokkaido for the final week of the ski season at Nisigo Grand Hirafu and Kiroro. It's a really good time to visit the Nisigo Resort area with skiing in the morning, the potential to play golf in the afternoon, and the cherry blossom season is in full effect. I spent Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday skiing Nisigo Grand Hirafu with 10 centimetres of new snow on Tuesday morning and spring skiing in the sunshine on Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday was the final day at Nisigo Grand Hirafu for the season and it's been a cracker. Still plenty of snow up on the mountain, uh, but they've closed because there's just no business. And Friday, I skied Kiroro Resort with my longtime ski partner, Ian. Great piece skiing. Edges really taking a bite on the fantastic groom conditions. And even the trees weren't that bad. Great news released in the last couple of days. From the 1st of June, the borders are looking to open to tourists, which means that the 2022-2023 winter season in Japan is on. So I uh, mentioned Listex before. If you listen to episode 92, listener, you'll have heard Babsy Lapwood, who was on, just explaining about it. It's a networking event for the industry. You know, I really enjoyed it. I found it really useful. And I took the opportunity while I was there to ask a few people from the industry, you know, why they were there and also uh, how last season went for them. And a couple of other specialists, including Phil Brown, about how school sales are going. And also uh, Ian Brown, uh, no relation, who's the MD of uh, the Snow Centre itself, uh, about their record numbers that they've had through the door uh, this winter. All right, I'm here with Colin Matthews from uh, Merry Ski. Tell me, why have you come along to Listex? Uh, I come to Listex sort of each year, really, uh, Ian, just to enjoy meeting people in the ski industry, see what's going on in the ski industry, help people feeling the end of the season, because obviously May time tends to be the end of the season. Just get, just meet people, some old people, some old friends, some new people. Always interesting people here, really. Yeah, it? brilliant. Just, it's just a great way fun, to yeah. wrap up the season, isn't it? And I can ask you another question. How did last winter go for you at Mary Ski? Actually, surprisingly well, I think. Given what was thrown to us sort of at the, as COVID was unravelling, deploying staff, uh, Macron closing the frontiers for three yeah. or four weeks. And so <laughs> a lot was thrown at us. But I think we've come through the end. I think we've ended up being a pretty stable season. And looking forward for next season. Great. Excellent. Thanks very much. Here with Nick Williams from Mountain Heaven. Why have you come to Listex uh, today, Nick? I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is to actually meet people in the ski industry that we haven't done for a couple of years because of COVID. Uh, physical meeting rather than online meeting. Yeah, so completely... much better. <laughs> so fed up of online. <laughs> Can't do any more. And the second one is, uh, is actually to meet new suppliers as yep. well to actually help expand our business, get new ideas, that sort of thing. Brilliant. And last winter, how did last winter go for you? Uh, amazingly well considering we actually shut down for four weeks in most chalets five weeks in a few other chalets yeah. so actually the winter we were 100 percent full for the weeks we shut down so that was a big blow to a small yeah. company but luckily enough we were almost 100 percent full for the rest of the season so actually despite being shut down we did okay in the end brilliant that's great to hear thanks very much thanks a lot uh, with phil brown he's a bit of an expert on the school side of things uh, here at listex I'm interested, after a couple of years of COVID, it's been a, a nightmare, I think, for school trips. Has this winter just gone look better, and how's it looking for next winter? This winter looked a little better. Some yeah. schools travelled, but not anywhere near as many as would have travelled previously. Easter was considerably busier as we moved away from more restrictions. But next season is looking a lot better. The is it? Schools tour ops I talk to yeah. are very, very positive with the number of bookings they are getting now and the number of the amount of interest compared to even pre COVID. Okay. It seems to be a real appetite. Excellent, that's really good. Right, I'm here with Stephen Morgan, who is the organiser of the uh, the Birmingham show, or to give it its full title, the National Snow Show, happening in October. Uh, you're here at Listex, we have a little conversation, we're going to do the ski podcast uh, live again at the show, but you know, wh why are you here at uh, Listex? I suppose it's a great opportunity to really kind of um, get embedded in the industry, meet everyone, um, and particularly this year, because of situations last year that we all know about, you know, travel and all that, <laughs> which we're trying to forget, yeah. put to the back of our memory. This year at the snow uh, snow show, national snow show, sorry, we want um, more destinations yep. and resorts and tourism boards to really kind of 
um, quench that thirst that our visitors have for, <laughs> for that. <laughs> Go on, this is a perfect place for meeting people like that, yeah? Definitely. They're, they're, you know, everyone's here, Mountain Trade Network brings them all together, so yeah, 100% good place to do it. Cool, that's great. Thanks a lot, Stephen. Hi then with uh, Vanessa Fisher, who's appeared on the show a few times before. Tell us why you're here today at uh, Listex. Well, I wanted to come to Listex to listen to James Gambrell giving his latest um, update on the ski industry. find that data really interesting and useful to feed back to some of my resort clients. And then it's also interesting just to catch up with people and sort of feel, get a feel for what's going on in the industry in the slightly quieter months. Uh, here with uh, Ian Brown, Managing Director of the Snow Centre here at Alistex. Thanks very much for hosting us. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, yesterday, you uh, spoke to everybody, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, just to uh, tell them a few ground rules for the event. And one of the things that you said, which I found really interesting, was that you said that uh, uh, this winter, Chill Factory, which you own uh, as well, uh, and the snow centre had had record numbers coming in through the uh, spring, and that was, that is really great news. I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on that at all. Oh, absolutely! It's been an amazing winter, really. Yeah, you know, we came into the winter months. If you remember, there was still an element of lockdown happening, restrictions in place, not just in the UK but in Europe as well. Um, and so we came into the winter months. Uh, probably worth saying we had a really good summer. Yeah, you know there was definitely pent up demand. Uh, people had missed their snow sports. As soon as all the centres were open again, they were keen to come get their skis out, get their boards out and come back. So I think we were blessed with that to begin with. Yeah. And that momentum continued into the, into the winter months. Uh, we hit Christmas. Christmas was OK, but I think there was an element of, you know, COVID was still prevalent at the time. And why would you, I know, put yourself at risk at an indoor centre and put your, put your whole Christmas at risk by catching COVID? Yeah. Then Boxing Day came and it was busy. And then the big change, if you remember, was when France reopened their borders in middle of January and all of a sudden holidays were back on. Still an element of a risk of, you know, do people want to travel and everything went with that. But I do think a lot of people thought, do you know what, we want to get back to this. Uh, and we really saw it sort of hit with a bang from then on. Yeah. And do you think then there's a sense that this, the increased number of people through the door were people who wanted to get some skiing in before their holiday that they were taking? Or are these just people who wanted to go skiing regardless and wanted to get back on snow? I, I think it was both. I mean, definitely talking to people, um, you, you had three types of people. Those who booked a holiday, so it was just getting that practice before they went. There were those who, you know, we're not going to go away this year, we're still a bit cautious, but we just, you know, we've missed it. We want to get back on the snow and just enjoy that snow experience. And then probably sadly, the third one, and I remember this particularly over the Christmas period at both sites serving people was, you know, are you going away this year? Yeah, we should have been in France now. Right. And so okay. our, our Christmas ski trip is now to the snow centre or to <laughs> Um But that, for me, excites me about next winter because I'm pretty certain there's a lot of people out there who didn't go away this year, either to their own choice because of concerns or because their trips were cancelled. I'm hoping we're going to have a bumper winter and the industry will have a great year next year. That's brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Ian. You're welcome. Cool. So that was that was really good to catch up with loads of people there from uh, the industry. And I think in general, it's been a, you know, a positive season. Certainly that's what people were reporting. One of my guests today is Jasmine Taylor. She's been on the show a couple of times before. In fact, I'll put a link to the show notes. We did a special bonus episode where we looked into your uh, career in detail. But I'd like I'm really interested in your season just gone as well, which congratulations. Uh, it's been an incredibly successful one. Uh, you know, well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it didn't start too too well. It wasn't exactly going to plan. And then I had a bit of a turnaround moment halfway through. Yeah, well, just to summarise, I think I'm right in uh, saying that this winter you had eight World Cup podiums and two wins. Is that right? Nice. Yeah, so that's pretty good. That makes it your uh, your uh, your best ever, and I think you've had seven uh, you know World Cup wins in total. So two of them this season. You finished second uh, in the world uh, overall, which is your highest ever ranking. Clearly, uh, you know that is a really successful season. And I have read a little about it. You said it didn't start so well. You mentioned Jasmine; it didn't quite start as well as you hoped. I mean, you'd had good results. You just weren't on the podium. You're kind of in the fourth, fifth, sixth positions. Yes, and um, based on the Fizz Cup events we were having, so, um, you know, same, basically same level of difficulty, nearly 
all the same competitors. I was doing really well in these events, getting to the World Cups and I think putting too much pressure on myself and just falling short of of the podium. But luck wasn't wasn't falling on my side. And then you start to question that and scratch your head a bit and it's frustrating as well. And I sort of took a step back after I got home from Norway and I thought all these decisions in my life, just little things that we all have to decide on, like what time to go to bed, what time to have dinner, um, should I go and see friends or should I make sure my skis are prepped within an inch of their life or being on time for training versus stopping off for a quick chat with somebody on the way, you know, being that very constrained in the way you approach things is um, perhaps admirable on one side because you're you're doing your absolute best to be the best you can be but on the other hand it takes away the fun and the magic of what you're doing and actually the point of why you're doing it yeah and I mean I find that really interesting because you understand that you know people have to make sacrifices to do well at the top level in in sport um, but I noticed in your blog post that one of your competitors, I think, is it Beatrice Zimmerman, uh, kind yeah. of, you know, suggested to you that you, you know, had a little change and do something for yourself. Yeah, she, um, she, she was having a difficult time as well. And she came to my room, hotel room, after the final day's racing in, uh, in Norway. And she said, Jazz, I do this thing when I'm upset. <laughs> and we opened the window and we both shouted at the top of our voices all the birds flew away everything took off and we just let it out it was amazing it was just uh yeah a bit of a release excellent excellent that, that's um I don't know scream therapy or something like that isn't it something like that but mm. you took a break and you went down to uh took a trip to Marseille yeah so during this chat with Bea because your competitors, but you also you spend a lot of time on the tour and we travel around and you get chatting to people and you realise the people that have the most in common with you really are your competitors because they know exactly how you feel. And she said to me, Jazz, when's the last time you did something for you? Not something because how it may or may not affect performance and skiing or results, that kind of thing, just something you want to do. And I honestly couldn't think of a single thing I had done, <laughs> which is sad. You think, God, I'm missing the point in life. What am I doing? So I got home and I called my coach, Seb, who was driving from Norway. So obviously beat him home with, with the plane and no, no luggage. Um, and I said, I had this idea just to go to Marseille for a night, do something fun. And he said, I don't know why you're still on the phone to me, Jazz, go. <laughs> so I did. I got in my car and I, I just went five hour, five hour drive, and it gave me so much energy. Just doing something because you can and you're alive, and and why not? You know, brilliant. And then after that, you know, you came back into. I think the next event was in Les Ouches, which is your hometown, anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, flying into it with some great results. Yeah, I mean, I I won the next event, and I stayed on the podium until practically the very end of the season so it's and consecutive it, the consistency and it's it was such a it was such a turnaround it, it's so interesting you know the the psychology it's really you've got to find what works for you and I'm sure that in your time uh, you know as a, a an athlete you've you know thought about uh, the different mental approaches that you've got to take to it and suddenly you find that you know one where you're just like easing back a little bit instead of really focusing uh, 100 percent on something has been what's uh, flicked the switch and actually made a difference mm -hmm. yeah and, and you don't realize what what happens prior to the start gate you see the the times on the sheet that actually arriving at the start gate, I think there was one event in Switzerland. I was late, really, really late. And I'm right. coming up the chairlift, shouting <laughs> to my uh, teammates below. I'm like, guys, can you un untie my skis? Uh, I, need, I need those gloves. And they're all like, huh, what? And because the boys <laughs> go after the girls, yeah. they, was, they just took off. And it was amazing as well to have that team effect. 
I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because that was something I was going to mention as well, because it does feel that, um, you know, I haven't followed the other members of the team as closely, but evidently, you know, this year, the uh, GB uh, Snowsport Telemark uh, team has been also uh, more successful than it's ever been. I think you're ranked fifth in the nations uh, overall. Other team members, such as, uh, is it Tim Goff has had his best season ever as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tim had a 10th place which is huge. That's just brilliant. And it's um, expected as far as I'm concerned. He's been training hard and he's ready. That Those things happen when you're ready for it. And, um, you know, it's not an accident. That that comes when it's supposed to. But the, do you think it may, it's made a difference to you or perhaps to, to all of you to be in a team and competing at these events together? Is it a, a kind of rising tide floats all boats uh, effect definitely yeah you share in each other's success and it becomes about the team less about you and I think that's good for you it's I don't think it's ever good for us to be too concerned with how we feel and what we're doing normally it's healthy to have other focuses and I noticed that you've got some tremendous photos that uh, GB Telemark have uh, taken, you know, across the season. You know, really good. But I was looking very closely at your uh, speed suits in those uh, photos uh, and I couldn't quite work it out. Are those uh, are they dragons on your legs or something <laughs> like that? What's going on there? These suits have caused much, uh, <laughs> much debate, actually. So they're supposed to be Spitfires. Not ah. Right. A teammate of mine that designed them but the idea was british racing green and uh, a spitfire design and it was a sort of meant to be like a go faster looking type suit and actually in photos i think it looks quite cool but it's not i don't feel that feminine in it put it that way <laughs> well they look very spectacular and i'll put some photos into the show notes so listener you can understand what we're uh, what we're talking about there but you know congratulations you know it's it's great that you've had such a you know a, a good season and i guess uh, you know you're obviously in hintertooks doing your uh, basie training just now but what what comes next you're back in the uk uh, for a while you know recovering do you, your training goes through a different period through the summer before the racing starts again uh, next winter? Well, I never do the exactly the same programme twice. And this year is um, no exception. I'm actually heading to Australia in about three weeks time. So, yeah, a new, a new approach, a new adventure, something different. Um, so, yeah, I'll be on skis, but alpine skiing, actually. Okay, so is that working or are you racing there? What, what, and where oh, will you be going in Australia? Yes, I'll be going to Hotham and I will be working as a ski instructor and a race coach. And then I will hopefully have, you know, spare time to ski for myself and, of course, the evenings to train. So I shall be very busy. Cool, that's great. I don't know if you noticed, but Hotham tweeted this morning they've just had their first snow. Ah. Oh. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But that's, you know, that's kind of uh, encouraging. And I certainly I know that they'll be uh, looking forward to the season. Well, that should be great. That should be uh, really good to to stay on snow and be able to, you know, get skiing in uh, every day and be able to keep your uh, fitness there. And you come back in the autumn in the build up to the season again. Yeah, it will pick up the same as always. Uh, and 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 it was um, Martina, I don't know how it's pronounced, Wiss or Weiss. Weiss, was, uh, yeah. Vice, who is number one uh, in the world. So is she uh, in your sights? <laughs> is, it, is that the goal to kind of uh, knock her off of the top spot for next winter? Of course. Well, the Swiss are extremely strong in Telemark. They are probably one of, well, they are one of the very best nations. And uh, of course, the ones to be. Excellent. Well, I wish you all the best uh, with that. And thanks for joining us again, Jasmine. Really appreciate it. Uh, ha well done on a great season. Always enjoy talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. Right. Uh, well, you mentioned that you started or during your season, you were in uh, uh, Norway. Uh, Rob, uh, uh, on the show for the first time uh, today, you said you're in Norway only uh, uh, like 12 days ago or, or something. I wondered why you picked uh, Norway and Narvik in particular for this trip. I've skied in Norway um, a few years ago with, with my son, Harry, and I just loved the whole vibe of it. Um, obviously, the mountains aren't 
as big as the Alps, but you know, obviously it's the home of skiing. They, I think they were skiing 4,000 years ago. And obviously when it comes to the Winter Olympics, they, they have got the biggest you know, medal hall of any nation, 5 million populations. It's just one of those places and obviously beautiful, rugged scenery. And it's just that the whole ski culture, you know, they tend to do it in cabins and huts and things like that. I just wanted to go back and the chance to go up to the Arctic Circle was um, perfect. Right. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned home of skiing. I was thinking about the other, uh, the other day because I was at Listex uh, and the new uh, London Ski and Snowboard Festival were there and I was chatting to them. And I'm sure uh, the three of you probably remember if you've been along to the London show that uh, Norway are often a big partner and they're going to be a big partner again with that. And it, their logo is home of skiing, isn't it? And I've always thought, oh, you know, home of skiing seems a bit strange. But as you say, I think skiing was sort of invented in Norway, uh, as you say, 4,000 years ago or something like that? Well, it was just the practicality. They had to get around. So obviously the main thing is um, all the sort of Nordic Nordic events within the Olympics. You know, they, it's a biathlon and all the cross country, and that's where they predominate. Um, obviously, they produce some pretty good alpine skiers over the years as well, because even the, they might be, you know, you might get a thousand metre vertical in Norway. There's still some nice steep runs. So it's it's good enough to create the, te- the technical excellence for those disciplines as well so yeah and you mentioned the altitude then you said it's not as high I mean what are the heights we're talking about and, and the vertical drop that you're getting in in a resort like Narvik for example well there's about an 800 meter drop from the top you go pretty much straight from the fjord um, I suppose where the benefit is is there's um, peak there are peaks but obviously you've got a tremendous um, free ride um, capability there as well you get off the top lift and there's all sorts of back bowls but I suppose the amazing thing about Narvik is the views. You're looking over the fjord and then, you know, over towards Lofoten and there's just incredible snow-capped hills. But I suppose it's a little bit like being in the Lake District or the west of Scotland. You know, you've got those more rounded hills, but it's pretty impressive. I think the biggest mountain in Norway is nearly 3,000 metres. But it, because it's so entrenched in their way of life, um, there's lots of resorts everywhere with, just with one drag lift. We started the trip in, in Bergen and did a couple of resorts around there, but then flew up to... Narvik and frankly it's worth going just for the flights I think right. five flights in a week and just you just can't stop looking out the window <laughs> yeah and, uh, you know the pictures the variety of the, the scenery is just just amazing obviously the snow-capped fat they call them fells interestingly and the valleys are called dale a uh, darlin dales and really? the waterfalls are called foss so if you're in the north of England obviously you have a lot of familiarity with these terms but you've just got the most amazing variety of scenery you just you know literally you're glued to the window taking photographs all the time so if you were to look at my instagram page you'd see all the um all the wonderful scenes so yeah well we'll put a link to that in the show notes and he did send me some photos so obviously some uh, really really beautiful uh views and beautiful shots there and i think that for a lot of people that is the perhaps the uh, appeal of uh, norway i mean thinking specifically about narvik itself then you said uh, you flew to bergen how much further is the flight from bergen up to up to narvik it's a cu- couple of hours, two and a half hours. Yeah, so two and a half hours just across the same country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's huge. It's unbel- you look at the map, and it, obviously it's a very long, thin country, as as is Sweden. And then, it, you know, it's meeting up. Well, it's not that. It meets up with Russia at one point. It's not a million miles away from Murmansk. And that's why Narvik was a very important um, centre in the in the world in World War II. Because obviously Hitler's desire to go and take over Russia and obviously within Narvik, it was a key port for shipping all the iron ore out of Sweden for the mines in Karuna, because it was the only ice-free port in the winter. So Narvik is very strategically important. And if you think about it, it's a big place. I think it's one of the most northernmost towns in the world. It's a pretty big place for being, you know, 125 miles inside the Arctic Circle. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned you're in the Arctic Circle. So one of the things that I think people uh, consider uh, with that, even if you were there in April, is it? daylight 18 hours of sunshine i mean obviously we're too late for the northern lights obviously the northern lights which we all i think dream of seeing goes from about october to march and then you are starting to obviously get once you've had the equinox you tend you know in a month's time it's going to be um 24 hours of skiing that's the great thing we talked about this you know uh, the snow conditions it's like concrete first thing in the morning because what you forget is that it's the latitude i know in britain we tend to obsess about altitude, and that's why people like to go to the gulags of France above the tree line. But oh, um, harsh. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, once you've got the latitude, you know, the snow stays great. Actually, 
the best skiing was about four o'clock in the afternoon. So it's the antithesis of spring skiing. It softens off and then it's great. And I, I think you, you can do night skiing in Narvik. And obviously, you know, the lifts are open. Um, well, I think they're closing next weekend. But you can ski under the midnight sun. That's the attraction. And obviously, if you're a ski tourer, Narvik's perfect as well because there's some really, you know, tremendous tours as well as the free ride options. So. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think a lot of people would probably like the idea of not having to get up early in the morning and being able to uh, take your time and uh, and do your skiing in the afternoon. What about the, the lift system then? You mentioned there's a, a lot of free ride opportunities. Uh, you know, how many lifts and, and mark a, are there? Is it a bigger area? Well, I think there's about 24 k's of pisted runs, but I think that's not the, the, the main goal. And if you wanted more pisted areas, there's plenty of options within within Norway, places like Mercadalen and, and Voss. But um, there's a big, very big gondola, which has got the Porsche design cabin, which is very slick. That gets you up to a two man chair. And then there's drag lifts. So there's enough to keep you busy. And there's some very good runs. You virtually ski right back into Narvik town. But the very interesting thing is they've, um, Narvik have actually bid for the 2027 Alpine World Championships. And if they get that bid, I mean, they are an outside chance um, that the Norwegian government's going to put in almost 30 million into more infrastructure um so i think it's one of these places is just going to grow and grow and i think it's increasingly becoming on people's bucket list because the pictures as you know are just simply stunning you know with the yeah. skiing down to the fjords and you know this obviously the sunlight and even you know sun setting at late at night it's just quite special i'm glad i went there it's not one of those you know this is a season where i've been striking resorts off my bucket list and i'm so glad i went there the thing is there's lots of other things to do as well we went on the Arctic train, which is the train line that ships all the iron ore, to Riksgransen. It's actually illegal to go snowmobiling in Norway. They're very eco-conscious. And, uh, you know, if you were caught snowmobiling in uh, Norway, you'd probably have a police helicopter chasing you across the across the fells. And okay. uh, so we went across to Riksgransen and went uh, skidoing, which was something else. And then, um, you know, there's all the options over there. There's two or three ski resorts over there. And then there's the Polar Park, which is the northernmost zoo, I suppose, where you can actually um, go into a pen with with wolves. Um, And there's a beautiful lodge you can stay at that um, Megan and Harry have stayed at, where you're literally surrounded by the wolves. And you can actually go in with the handlers and actually sit and commune with the wolves. There's lots of things to do there. And that's, I would say, for Norway, that's what, if you want a winter holiday... Um, that's probably what it's what it's about. I mean, you can if you're a peace skier, you'll ski out Narvik in a couple of days, uh, but you can very easily with uh, the flights and the trains string together a couple of resorts in a week and lots of other fantastic things to do. Cool, that is very interesting. Can I ask, are you writing up uh, an article for anyone about I, this trip, or was it for your own personal? Uh, yes, enjoyment? I'm going to be writing an article for skier and snowboarder, uh, Frank Baldwin. He he knows that I like to go to the strange places. <laughs> I had a a week in Turkey earlier in the season because he knows Rob's always up for a slightly weird one. So I'm not a big fan of the mega resorts and I like to just go somewhere a bit different because I think it's the, you know, you have a real travel holiday um, as opposed to just pounding the piece all day. So yes, that'll be appearing probably in the, in the autumn edition. Excellent. Well, I look forward to reading that one, although I like the idea that we've got an exclusive on on uh, a Frank Scoop Baldwin on the on the podcast here as well. Oh, it'll, be, it'll be wrapping my knuckles, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, Rob. Thank you very much for that. That is a really interesting timing that you uh, uh, contacted uh, me and you mentioned you've been out to Narvik. And I thought, oh, this fits in really well, because actually one of our uh, uh, listeners, uh, Chris Howie, who was on the show uh, back in the early days when he talked about a trip to uh, Iceland, uh, went out uh, possibly around the same time that you did to Svalbard, which I kind of sort of vaguely knew was up north somewhere. And now I've located it on a, on a map, kind of, I think, probably on a similar uh, uh, latitude to where you were. Um, but I had a chat with him about that trip. So let's have a listen to that. I am delighted to be joined by Chris Howie uh, today. Chris contacted me via the site and we've just had a chat in the green room. Turns out he is listened to every episode of the podcast. We actually uh, uh, had him on a while ago talking about Iceland. But Chris, welcome to the podcast today. How are you? Great, Ian. Lovely to be here. Thanks. Thanks for organising this session. No problem. Well, the reason I wanted to organise it is he sent me an email saying, oh, you know, would you be interested in talking about Svalbard, skiing in Svalbard? First, the first thing I had to do was go onto the map and and look it up, see where it is. I wonder if you'd just like to explain to us where Svalbard is. 
It's 78 degrees north, so it's the first, it's the most northerly place on the planet. So it's two hours uh, by plane north of Norway. So it's right at the top of the top of the planet, really. It's comprised. Svalbard is a series of islands, but the main island is called Spitsbergen, and the capital is Longyearbyen. So that's where you're based, and then we kind of uh, grabbed a guide and, and toured around from from the capital. So um, in different areas, really. Great. I can imagine uh, listeners are probably just like pausing and looking up where, where it is now. I think some people probably wouldn't necessarily think of it as being a ski destination. You said it's in, uh, in a very far, a long way north, the most northerly inhabited place in the uh, in the planet. What what made you decide to go there? I fall in love with skiing in Norway. You have Mike Richards on from time to time, and he skis in different areas around the planet. And I've kind of taken a leaf out of his book. So when we spoke last with when Jim was with you on the podcast, yeah, we went skiing in Iceland. So we then skied Lingenalps in northern Norway, and as well as uh, the Highlands in Scotland. So obviously the Cairngorms and part of the Nevis Range as well. And I thought it made sense to try Svalbard because. It's the most northerly points. Um, there are polar bears there. It's minus 35. It's walruses as well. So it's a, it's a challenging location. In terms of the actual skiing itself, then, you mentioned that you booked yourself a, a, a guide. Um, take it there are no lifts there. So how do you access your skiing and how is traveling around the place? In Norway, you, you, you have to do ski touring. There's no lifts. They don't allow helicopters and they don't allow um, snowmobiles. So... And I'm not the best ski tourer. My friends are very good. So we chose Svalbard primarily because it's Svalbard is, a, is its own entity. It's a visa-free location and it's its own country, although it's managed by Norway. But they allow snowmobiles. So um, we landed in the capital. We got a guide and we did about 300 kilometers with snowmobiles staying in a place called Ishfjord uh, radio station, which is way out of the other side of, of Spitsbergen. We did two days of ski touring where you're climbing up and, and then skiing back down. But obviously it's very, very cold. So you've got to you know, obviously prepare accordingly. And, and one day of um, ski snowmobiling where you kind of the two of you would rotate up to the top. You'd pick a line, ski back down. And then another two with the guide would then go to the top. So the guide always has to look after you primarily because of the polar bear risk. That's yeah. not your normal. Normally you're picking a guide to kind of save yourself from uh, avalanches and, you know, to pick the route. But um, polar bears are, are a different challenge. You said it was very cold. What, what do you mean by very cold? That means different things to different people, I think. Yeah, no, that's so it's it's regularly when we were there. And that's the first week in April. It was minus 20 on the thermometer. But wind chill was like minus 35, minus 40. Wow, that is horrible. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's it's okay because the the, the guide and it, we went with the base camp explorer team, and they gave us all the gear. So you're wearing kind of emergency suits. So effectively, you've got your ski gear on underneath your emergency suit, your your outdoor suit, and you've got your boots on as well. And then obviously, when you went ski touring, you just uh, transitioned um, into your skis and, and ski boots, etc. Climb the mountain. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful because it is very, very cold. Obviously, transition back and then put your suit back on. So it's um, Ian. We had blue sky days every single day. So um, I, I didn't feel cold at all, to be frank. I mean, I'm more cold in the Alps, really. Okay. I mean, it's interesting how it, how it can vary. The actual top line temperature doesn't always tell you what it's going to be like. What what kind of altitudes are, were you looking at there? Then you know, how much are you doing ski touring? Uh, you know, to get a, a descent. Yeah, that, that um, it's I would say five six hundred meters. It, they're not high. Um, if you look at the the um, the kind of the uh, tundra there, and obviously the the out landscape, if you will, it, the mountains are not that high. They're quite steep and they're quite um, quite pointed. So if you look at some of the obviously the YouTube videos, you'll you'll see some um, a great um, idea of it's, it's. But it's fairly icy. So a fair bit of ice and a fair bit of um, you know blown snow and a fair bit of rock. So our skis have all been fairly heavily scarred on the way way down. But we managed to find some powder as well. So what was lovely is the guy knew where the powder was going to be. So you can pick a line and we had, you know, a morning of fantastic skiing with the snowmobile. So uh, that was really, really enjoyable because the, was, you could let the skis run and, and there's nobody around bar, bar a couple of walruses and polar bears, that's all. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that we were chatting earlier about one of the appeals of going to a place like this is that there aren't any other skiers. And you also kindly sent me a few of your photos, which uh, I had a look at. Some of those landscapes, the vistas just look unbelievable believable you know it stretches for miles and miles and all you can see are white mountains and blue skies and and i guess uh, uh ice lakes stretching into the distance yeah you're um you're going over the sea because the sea is frozen 
Um, so in parts of that, you're with the guide all the time. And the guide was fantastic. You know, they, they have obviously a rifle and they have a flare gun for any polar bears. But they've also got all the lunch and all the emergency kit that, that you need as well. But um, we were really lucky because the blue sky days were fantastic. And, and the conditions were really, really good as well. So and as I said, we were the base camping sport team. So if anybody wants to go up there, I'd be delighted to speak to them. But um, yeah, they were super. So it's just a little bit of a different kind of skiing holiday. That's all. And not just uh, skiing, because I don't know if you're a, a, a Wim Hof uh, fan, but one of the photos you sent me is of someone. I don't know if it's you or not. Uh, and it looks like they're kind of submerged in basically an ice lake. It looks very, very cold, but probably really good for you. It was fantastic. So the, the water was minus 1.1 degrees Celsius because it's fairly salty. And um, the, the, the radio station where we stayed had a small sauna. So you change in the sauna, but um, you all, we, that was the sea ice. So we walked into the sea ice and that was my son. That was Ben Fisher. He was right. in the ice, but he did his Wim Hof and stayed in there for about four minutes or something. But it is incredibly cold. And then you have to make a dash straight back to the sauna. But well worth it, as, as you've seen with Wim Hof stuff. Right. Well, I mean, it sounds fascinating. So after places like Iceland and Svalbard and you've obviously skied, uh, you know, across Europe, wh where's next on your list? Where do you, are you running out of places to go to? No, no, no. We were thinking the Himalayas, so Gulmarg, but I think we're looking more towards uh, Japan in 2024. So, and then the likes finish it off in New Zealand. I want to spend uh, a couple of months down in New Zealand at some stage. It sounds brilliant, Chris. Well, I hope that uh, when you do uh, tick these off your bucket list, you'll come uh, back and, and tell us what it was like. And thanks uh, very much today. And what I'll do is I'll put some of those photos uh, in the show notes. And if anyone is interested in uh, in contacting uh, Chris about Svalbard or any of these other destinations, just drop me an email and I'll pass it uh, on to him. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Chris. Super. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate it. Right. So that was interesting. You know, uh, evidently there's a lot of skiing you can do a long way north in the northern uh, hemisphere. I think I'm probably the only one uh, on the podcast today who hasn't been to uh, Norway. Al, you mentioned to be in the green room. You learned to ski there. Is that right? Yeah. So I grew up in the northeast of England and actually getting to Norway was pretty quick for our school. And I learned to, to ski in Voss. And then since then, I've skied in, I've skied in Hemsedal, which was amazing as well. So, yeah, I... Uh, I really love Norway. I think it's a fantastic place to ski. Right. Excellent. And Jazz, you've um, evidently raced uh, in Norway uh, this season. I noticed one of the resorts there was called uh, Al, possibly named after Al Morgan. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah, just A-L. So who knows? <laughs> Cool. OK, well, that's excellent. Uh, if that'll go on my uh, list. Uh, I think, as you know, I'm trying to kind of cut down the number of flights. So getting to Norway is a bit more difficult uh, for me. But, you know, one day I'll do it and it's on my bucket list. Certainly need to see the fjords uh, at some point. Right. Let's uh, um, move on. In the last episode, uh, I interviewed uh, or I played an interview I did with uh, Christophe Aubert, the mayor of uh, Leders Alp, and he told us about how they protect the glacier and some things like that. But I also asked him about all the new lift uh, changes in infrastructure that they've got going on in Ladies Out over the next couple of years. So let's uh, have a listen to that. So uh, you've got a new lift company as of last winter anyway, uh, Sarta Des Out, and they're doing a lot of work on upgrading the lift system. I think the spend is in a region of like 100 million euros over five years. The first lift, I think that went in in that is Super Venosk. I'm actually staying at MMV uh, Le Clarine and that lift basically serves that uh, that set of new buildings you can walk out the door go up a lift mm -hmm. and get up this chairlift on the valley launch side of the mountain so that's the first stage but there's quite a few other plans as well for upgrading the lifts in the in the resort aren't there that's been precise uh just outside the building you can climb up this uh new cable car and actually be used for skiing it'd be used for uh biking this yep. summer actually we really want to have a, a big leisure uh a place over there uh, because it's so nice at the top of the mountain you get like a, a 360 view uh, on all the mountains all around with uh, Parc des Ecrans uh, with mountains that are higher than 4,000 meters and when you go skiing down there it's usually very nice uh, in the morning yeah it's on the south right. it's on the south facing side mm -hmm. so good there and it's only the first one the next one is coming this year on uh, the same mountain on the other side uh, and we're taking all the old pylons, all that old things, old stuff that we got and replacing them uh, 
with just two ski lifts uh, total for the mountain and it will be very well uh, deserved. And also I think it's quite important as well because this is Les Deux Alpes. That's one Alp, isn't it? And this is the and other Alp, the right? the other one. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. On the Gendry side, uh, not this year, uh, but the year after, we got uh, a first uh, stage of uh, what we call the uh, 3S yep. coming. Uh, this is a major uh, investment uh, in the ski industry, uh, in Les Alpes especially. There won't be two of them in the French Alps. It'll be really like the the most modern equipment there is uh, in the French Alps. Take, uh, of course, skiers or people that go for a trail or for uh, ice climbing or ice uh, uh, walking, even for a discovery. Uh, they, it will take people to a new um, a set of experience uh, for sometimes just uh, trading, just sometimes seeing. And let's say if they would come uh, this Whole season, maybe they will see, uh, you know, uh, the new World Cup season. I've been on the 3S lift in Zermatt. Is the, it nice? Oh, it's beautiful. It's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, you're saying to me you're going to have that uh, here. Presumably it will be much faster and uh, have uh, a greater uplift capacity than the existing lift. Uh, it will be faster, more comfortable. And uh, in comparison with what we said just before, there will be less pilots as well. Yeah. Because uh, to go to the... Uh, to the first station, yeah. it would take us uh, 15 pylons. Yeah. With this uh, equipment, we will only need uh, seven. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting as well, because it, sometimes people go, oh, you know, this resort's putting in a new lift, you know, it's really bad for the environment, etc. But in this case, you're actually, you know, giving back the uh, nature, flora and fauna, gets more space to be able to uh, occupy itself. I don't know, the, there's an expression in English, which is nature abhors a vacuum nature hates a vacuum mm -hmm. so when there's a space there it moves into it uh, that's exactly what we're doing but um, it's uh, our intention we do it uh, willingly uh, we give back to nature as much as we can so we're not building new we're just uh, rebuilding and that's true for uh, this key infrastructure uh, the bikes infrastructures as well, yeah. and uh, the building in in town as well. Yeah. We're trying to renew everything. It's not building more. It's just same place but nicer. And the, the new um, John Drew lift then, it's going to have an extra stop because currently it goes all the way up to 2,600 meters, I think, mm -hmm. but it's going to stop in Le Cret as well. Uh, that's what we wanted, but uh, the contract won't allow it. Ah, so, okay. Uh, that would be the next step. Uh, that would be even, let's say, a greener or better for tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we are to stay in the contract. Okay. And then um, the Diablo chairlift, which is the one that we've been using, you know, most days to get onto the mountain to start Coming off with. Year. So what's happening there with Diablo? Um, we got the the ropes already, well, the cables. Yeah. And we're uh, kind of plugging new eggs, uh, you'd say. Yeah. Uh, just next to the seats, so it would be a better experience for people taking it. It's going to be a lift that alternates between chairlifts and gondola, is that it? That's it. Yeah. And the, let's say, the, the band weight will be better. And no, they, they're just not joking. The, the better experience also comes uh, with the gondola. When you're taking this lift at night, you will be able to go to the top of the Diable, uh, having dinner there and coming back. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, sorry, when will that one be completed then? Uh, normally, it should be done by the end of this fall season, so for next winter. Right, okay, so opening in December 2022. And Jondry would open in December 2024? Um, First station 2023 and uh, the line in total 2024. I also read that um, I think it's with the uh, Pierre Gross uh, gondola, which is a very nice gondola already. Feels very new. It looks quite good. But you're going to make some changes there as well? Well, this one was not complete and we are um, uh, in a way repairing it and making it complete. So the experience is better. Okay. Uh, you got the view already. That's what you s you've seen. Yeah. Uh, but it's in a very extreme environment that's why uh, we needed to get uh, more sensors and more uh, stuff equipped in this uh, gondola cool well that's great so you know clearly that uh, 
that hundred million is being spent uh, uh, well, and yeah, based on my experience of the three S lift, that genre lift will be amazing. May say a word more. Because, yes, of course. Uh, we talked about the uh, cable ropes or um, gondolas or ski lifts, but the most important thing we are putting m money into uh, where people are sometimes uh, biking or hiking or skiing, and that's the most important thing because you use the uh, the ski lifts or well. Uh, whatever you call them to go up but actually the experience is when you go down or when you go hiking uh, in the middle of nature and that's the part of the experience we want to expand and that we want everyone to have you mean uh, that it's multi-purpose it's not just for uh, for skiers it's for hikers for bikers etc as well yep Okay, well, that 100 million looks like it's going to be well spent. Uh, and I look forward to coming back and, and checking the uh, progress on uh, all of those. That's, uh, that's uh, brilliant. Um, Monsieur Aubert, Christophe, thank you very much. Right, that was really interesting. Clearly, a lot of things going on in, in Des out there. And uh, it's going to be get, uh, a lot quicker to get up to the glacier uh, than it is currently on the uh, Jondry, uh, on, on the Jondry lift. Um, Al, coming to you, uh, I wanted to, you brought this up in the last episode. Uh, and I think, you know, we do talk about ski touring quite a lot on the podcast, mainly because I'm interested in it, you're interested in it. It has become very popular uh, through lockdown, etc. But um, we did have a, a question that cropped up recently. Sometimes we talk about pin touring bindings. And I wondered if you could just explain what that is to the uninitiated, these different bindings that you would have on touring skis. Yeah, no, well, hopefully I can help with that. So if you think about a regular downhill binding, a normal ski binding, you step in with your toe, you stand down with your heel and it's clamped in. If we go to Jazz's world and look at telemark bindings, the toe is attached to the ski and the heel is free to come up, uh, which is a lot more like walking. And this is what ski touring bindings are attempting to do. They allow the heel to come up so we can have a walking motion. So historically, these have been where the toe of the binding and the heel of the binding have been attached by some sort of plate, whether it be plastic, whether it be metal. The modern ones are nearly always metal or composite rails that attach the toe and the heel. Now, this is great because it allows you to ski like normal going down, step in as normal and tour, but they create a dead spot in the flex of the middle ski. But more importantly, they are heavy. You do not want weight when you are fighting against gravity. So if we go back a little bit to the 80s, this is an, an Austrian from the Tyrol region of Austria called Fritz Bartel, and he was climbing Mont Blanc, everything was really heavy, wanted to make a change, wanted to make things lighter. Sorry, he was climbing on skis. He'd come back off a tour somewhere, skiing and climbing, and then went to climb Mont Blanc, had skis with him, but the main outcome was he was just amazed by how heavy everything was and really frustrated by it and wanted to make it lighter. Light is fast, yeah, it's easier. So he tinkered for a couple of years, and in around 1984, he came up with this system of pins in the front, which were just like metal studs that he sharpened. And he'd also customized boots by putting holes in them. So if you look at a normal ski boot, you've got a lug at the front, so a step at the front, and a slightly bigger step at the back. On a pin touring boot, it looks the same, but you have little dints, little holes in the side of the toe lug. And in the heel, you have little slots vertically in the very back of the heel, right beside each other, not very really far apart, they're about a centimeter apart. And what his pin binding could then do is clip in the pins, the holes in the front of the boot. So 1990, then the touring company that we know of as Dinafit took this on board and the rest, as they say, is history. Since then, lots of brands have, uh, have got on board with this design, and then we've seen things move forward. But really, it hasn't gained in popularity until the last 10 or 20 years. Right. So interesting, isn't it? So essentially, we're saying you know, a couple of holes on either side of the kind of toe of the boot, the, the lug, as you put it, allow you to clip into those touring bindings because you can yeah. get you can fit a regular boot with the right binding that that original binding that you're talking about, just slot a regular boot. When, when I went ski touring in Morocco uh, a couple of years ago, my brother um, wanted to use his own boots. So they came. We, he hired skis that had that like a, a massive plate that yeah. sat on top of the ski and as you say really heavy you know and we yeah. were at altitude there he really regretted yeah so that's that, what we call that, that that's choice. what we call a, a frame binding so you can lock yeah. the heel down with a lever or something and then you release that and then you can go and walk mode but they are just so heavy if we look at the, the weight of a 
frame Turing binding, you, you, you're generally talking over a kilo peer binding, if not more. So there is uh, basically a, a formula that we use to calculate the, the load for you when you're ascending. So any weight on your feet is multiplied by five on your back. So if you've got a weight that's two kilos across your feet, that's 10 kilos on your back. So if you can take a kilo off each binding, then straight away you say it's like not having 10 liters of water in your bag. So that's saving you a lot of energy. Plus the boots are generally lighter. And this is all about efficiency. That is that is amazing because, uh, you know, I did this race, uh, which I reported on the last episode over in Cours Cheval, where part of it was ski touring. And, uh, you know, I asked the shop in advance, I could have a light pair of, uh, you know, skis if possible. Now I understand how important that is. I mean, that's such a huge difference. Did you say two kilograms of weight on your feet is worth 10 kilograms on your back? Yeah, so it's a multiple of five. So whatever you save off your feet is like saving five times as much out of your bag. So yeah. everybody buys lightweight packs and lightweight clothes and everything. But actually, it's arguably more efficient to save the weight on your feet because with every step, you've got to lift that and move it and, and move that uphill. So the walking motion on a pin binding is far more effective because the pivot point is closer to the ball of your foot where you naturally walk, which is fantastic. And the main thing is the low weight. Now, one thing that people worry about with pin bindings, you're used to stepping into a regular downhill binding. You feel really locked in and really held and massive power through the ski. And then because the pins at the heel are relatively close together and the pins in the toe are, are, are small, people imagine that it's really kind of disconnected and flimsy. So some of the earlier frame bindings, if we look at things like Fritchie Damia, like the Tietnell ones and twos, then you were kind of wobbly in those bindings. Pin bindings don't ski like that. They, they, they are amazingly positive when you ski them. I wouldn't be nervous about their skiing performance. And with the modern developments, they've just got safer and safer. So if we look at exactly what's available now, it's not just about being super lightweight because we've got hybrid bindings. So Marker, who made make brilliant frame bindings and kind of push that forward to have brilliant ski ability, but saving weight on a frame binding. They then brought out a binding called the King Pin. We talk of it as a pin tech binding. So you've got pins in the front and a step in heel. And then more recently, the Amma brands, Atomic, Salomon, and, and what is now Armada as well, brought out a binding called the Shift, whereby you step in it totally like normal, like a downhill binding. So you step in at the front, Step in at the back, skis like a normal downhill mining. There's no connection bars between the toe and heel. But when you go into tour, you flick a lever at the front and it exposes some pins. So touring on it is like pins. So if we look at Salomon's older bind in the Guardian, that was about three kilos a pair. It's about 1,500 grams per binding. If we look at a really lightweight pin binding, then you may be looking at 300 grams-ish for, for a lot of them and lighter. But the king pin's around 680 grams, and then the shift is around 880 grams. So we're still saving a massive amount of weight, but we've got that ski ability. Yeah, huge amount of weight. Well, that, that is really interesting. And I think uh, in a future podcast, it'd be interesting to talk about the kind of hybrid boots that you can get that have uh, the, the pin um, availability on the front, on the lugs, uh, but also give you the kind of performance of an alpine boot as yeah. well. Yeah, and I think also, you know, we talk about ski touring quite a lot, but uh, some people will be aware that ski mountaineering, which effectively is competitive uh, ski touring, is going to be in the next Winter Olympics because it's a demonstration sport in uh, Milan Cortina because the Italians, are, you know, they're allowed to pick uh, their own demo sport and they're quite good at it. Shame they didn't pick Telemark, but uh, yeah, ski mountaineering will be uh, there. So as we get nearer to that, it'll be really interesting to see uh, whether interest uh, you know, further develops in ski touring as well. That's brilliant, Al. Thank you very much for that. All right, we're going to come to the close now. I'd love to keep talking, but we've got to try and uh, uh, wrap it up. I, you know, I do enjoy all feedback about the show, so please do get in contact, listener. Um, reviews, comments, you know, wherever you want to leave them are always welcome, uh, in, either on Apple uh, Podcasts, Spotify, social media. We are at The Ski Podcast or via email, which is theskipodcast at gmail.com. 
Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Make Love Not Wars uh, on Instagram. He said, keep up the good work with the podcasting and tweets. Uh, Andrea Dalton on Facebook said another great episode. Uh, Paul Bond, he contacted us for some stickers. I hope you enjoy those. And if you'd like stickers, just drop me an email. And don't forget, there's 145 episodes to catch up on. I had a quick check. 93 were listened to in the last week. So if you've enjoyed listening to this and thinking, oh, wow, it must take so much time to plan, record and edit it. Uh, that is true. You're welcome to buy me a cup of coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ski podcast. Now, in episode 95, uh, I, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, Ski World, the tour operator, Latania, the resort, and Arnie Wilson, who skied uh, every day of the year for 365 uh, days back in 1994. We'll be on the show uh, as well. We'll be talking about that experience. Uh, you can follow me at Skipedia. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank Switzerland Tourism for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob, thanks very much. Yeah, very much enjoyed that. Thanks, Ian. Excellent. And Al, thank you. Thank you, Ian. And finally, listener, thank you for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.